I love comic books because they are about things like a duo of alternate reality Albert Einsteins doing battle with multiple rainbow-colored Joseph Oppenheimers. The medium is an unsupervised cluster of odd narratives and melded genres, which is probably the best thing about reading them. However, when you're trying to editorialize and comment on them, it makes it nigh impossible to categorize anything so that you can talk about it in broad terms. This was never more clear to me than when I sat down to assemble this Best of 2015 series, trying to jam all the crazy mumbo jumbo comic books produced in a year's time into digestible little servings of content labeled under Best of Blank was challenging as hell. So rather than drag this shit out until June, trying to make a video for everything from 2015, I decided just to scrape together all my final thoughts on the year and crowbar them into one final episode. That way we can all move on with our lives and focus on the year ahead. All right, so here we go. Ugh. There is definitely no shortage of nominations for this category. The first thing that comes to mind is Infinite Loop, but it have been like a half dozen videos at this point explaining why that series was an absolutely fascinating failure, so I'll avoid taking any more swings at this pus-filled pinata. The next two nominations that come to mind are Convergence and Secret Wars, as both proved to be inert, uninspired narrative dalliances. Convergence was probably the worst of the two, which is extra disappointing considering that DC has a track record of absolutely murdering about 99% of their event books. But as bad as it was, at least it had the decency to come and go in a few months while Secret Wars squatted over the Marvel Universe for pretty much the whole year. And okay, yes, I admit it. The main Secret Wars title was pretty damn cool and it had an immensely well-earned and satisfying payoff to it. But that didn't make the rest of the crossover books any less of a fruit salad of disjointed gobbledygook. Almost every title felt like a bridge to nowhere. Nothing had consequence or starred characters that had any space to develop. Everything was just so slick and fast and empty. It was like the whole thing was written by Rob Liefeld in 1994 and was only released now. I can't really pick one as worse than the other, and that's partly because each series seemed to be trying to be the other, and in doing so they produced this weird paradox of uninspired lameness. Neither series established a personality in which to be judged off of, and both made readers of the big two publishers feel like they were wasting their time. Two thousand eleven through two thousand fourteen was a time when Image really figured out who they were. This is an era where the producing of vanity projects for slighted artists had closed, and they began to focus on publishing higher thought books from fresher creators. Every single week was an assault of new series that pushed the medium forward and blew up best of lists across the internet. Image was probably still the best publisher of two thousand fifteen but it was a year where they suffered a few growing pains. The barrage of new quality titles finally hit Event Horizon. Sloppy titles started to mix their way into the publisher's lineup, and that delusion of quality, I feel, caused some really great books to get washed out and canceled. Some of the Pro Bowl titles started to suffer titanic delays, due in part to some changes to Image's publishing policy and partly due to creators stretching themselves a little bit too thin. That last issue could be solving itself, as many creators are leaving the big two publishers to write for Image full time. Fraction, Hickman, and Remender all left Marvel in 2015 to focus on doing creator-owned work, which is rad for Image, but gutting to Marvel. Marvel has grown to sort of be the grand czar of pop culture, but 2015 was not a great year for its comics branch. The cocktail of Secret Wars and the their creative bigwigs bailing leaves the company in a creative flux. They are still selling well, and their writing core of Nick Spencer, Jason Aaron, and Charles Soule is pretty good, but the House of Ideas has a lot to prove in 2016. This could give DC a chance to close the gap. With the exception of Convergence, they had an amazing year, managing to shake up the status quo of a bunch of characters, which is something that usually spawns an adult dose of reader rage, but sharp writing and wise editorial nudging made these choices feel pretty damn good. Cool. Before we move on from this topic, I want to make quick note of Boom Studios, whose 2015 looked a hell of a lot like the explosive era I talked about Image having earlier. A lot of awesome books got published over there, and they are starting to establish a consistent voice and feel across their titles. Look out for these guys. They may be demanding a spot at the big boy table very soon. How do I say goodbye?
I went to college in a very rural part of Wisconsin. The closest comic book store was in Dubuque, which was just far enough away from campus to be a complete pain in the ass to travel to every Wednesday. This was also the early 2000s, which was a time when digital distribution either didn't exist or existed in this weird limbo where it was technically functional, but completely untrusted. So for four years, I read roughly zero comic books. Then when I got out of college, I felt this pressure to be, well, a grown up. And at the time, I thought that meant leaving behind things like comics, video games, and other things that the hovering ghost of social maturity had deemed as kiddie stuff. So I focused on uh, trying to establish things like a grown up day job and paying the gas bill and uh, uh, buying Ottomans and whatever the hell else a 22 year old version of me thought adults did. Then a funny thing happened. I actually did grow up. And when I did, I realized that things like comics, video games, and other art was a huge part of what shaped and molded me not only into who I was, but who I wanted to be. And I decided to tell whatever formless enigma that had planted the idea that those things were somehow synonymous with kids to fuck off, because it made me happy and challenged me. So who the hell really cares? Anyway, by that time it was 2012, and Hawkeye by Matt Fraction and David Aja had just released his first issue. I picked it up on a recommendation from my brother, and... I was instantly in love. I had never read a book like it. Its voice was so personal, unique, and deliberately subversive. Aja was brave in the way that he played with conventions of comic book design and layout. Fraction seemed gleeful in the way that he pretty much did whatever the hell he wanted. Whether that was telling a story via an animated holiday special or via the point of view of a dog. The book championed a different brand of heroism, one that glorified a person's struggle to be a better man. Hawkeye's triumphs were more about managing to be less of a jackass than they were about punching Nazis or saving falling orphans. It was a superhero book that felt deeply personal, and it carried with it a resonating punch to the everyday life of its readers. Hawkeye made me fall in love with comic books all over again, and it forever changed the direction of my life. It showed me that comic books had the potential to be the true west of creative storytelling, and it awoke in me an analytical voice that I never knew was there. 2015 saw this amazing run end with what might be the best capstone issue of all time. And yeah, it was a super emotional moment for me. It reminded me of how far I had come and sort of made me reflect on all the choices, mistakes, and triumphs that have made me into who I am today. It also reminded me why comic books are important and why I try so hard to make a career out of writing about them. I just did a video on the top five ongoing series, so if you want to see a more robust look at this topic, just go ahead and check that out here. But if we're going to just look at what was the best series in the vacuum of 2015, it was Saga, and it really wasn't that close. Reading Saga month to month is a little bit like watching the moon landing. You feel like you are a witness to a great event in history. I'm not the first to say that if Saga sticks the landing, it has a chance to go down as the best comic book series of all time. 2015 was not only one of its best years, but it was a year that was tremendously important to cementing that lofty legacy. Brian K. Vaughn series tend to be really, really good in the beginning, really, really good at the end, and then sort of self-indulgent in the middle. I think the whole uh, traveling Shakespeare troupe part of Why the Last Man 2014 was that down period for Saga. One of its most interesting characters spent the whole year in a coma. The main family spent most of the year rooted on a single planet doing nothing, rather than jutting around the cosmos like we're used to seeing them do. And most of the villains just sort of farted around a bit. 2015 saw that dead period end. Status quo shifted almost monthly. We saw huge jumps in time and that swashbuckling across the universe formula that made the series such a joy to read returned with gory, lasery vengeance. It was just so, so, so much fun and so packed with interesting ideas and commentary on the various textures of the family dynamic. I don't think it's a wild thing to say that if you aren't reading Saga, you're doing comics wrong. And I have participated in enough hyperbolic jerking off of this book at this point that if you aren't reading it, it should be clear that it's time to drop the 10 smackers for the trade already. Fuck's sake. Congratulations to the whole VGTM community. We have closed out two years of existence. 
Thank you so much for sticking with us through all the programming changes we've had this year. 2016 is a year we have big time plans for, and we really feel this is the year the channel is going to rise to the next level. We look forward to sharing that with all of you. Peace out. I'll see you next time. No problem. Just write a book that's the funniest thing in the entire medium while also making it touching and also making it serve as a dissertation on several of the flaws in our modern society and also, you know, just populate that story with charming characters whose relationships unfold and blossom in realistic ways. Yeah, and then no problem. Just take all that and package it up in what is opaquely just a D&D &D parody book.